get on here. We're on. Hello. Good morning. Morning. Hello, guys. Morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Morning, all. Sure. So, um, let me. Um, I have an issue that I cannot record the meeting because I, I do not that. have the permission. <laughs> it's just auto recording already. Yep, you are just fine. It is auto You're recording good. into the cloud. No worries. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, sure. So let's start the meeting. And hey, Eden. Yes. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, Eden, Patrick, that I'm on a call. It's out of the. Okay, I see. Okay, so. Welcome everyone to the SIG application delivery meeting of October 9th, 2019. So I hope you guys have already opened the meeting notes because we today have, I think, three projects to present to the SIG application delivery. And so I don't want to waste your time so we can just begin our project presentation. I think the first project we have listed on the agenda is our goal proposal. So I will handle, I will, I will let Andy to handle the Argo presentation to everyone. Okay. Okay, thank you. Started. We can hardly hear you, by the way. Okay, is this better? Not really. Oh, I guess our microphone. I think you need to put the microphone closer. Okay, uh, it is already pretty close now. How about, how about now? Can you? No, not really. Okay. Uh, Maybe we let somebody else otherwise go first if you want to figure it out, but it's really hard to hear and I think it will be hard to have a discussion. Or you try it once more. Uh, okay. Let me see. Uh, let me get a, another microphone. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I'll mute myself. Plugging in another microphone. Okay, uh, how about now? Can you hear me better? That's perfect. That's great. Okay, okay fantastic. Okay, I'm glad that worked. <laughs> okay, can you see uh, my presentation? Yes. Go into presentation mode. There we go. Hi, it's Alexis just joining. I'll go on mute. Hi, good morning. Yeah. Good morning, Ed. Okay, so this is uh, the Argo proposal for essentially CNCF incubation. 
Thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to present. Uh, first, uh, what is Argo? Uh, Argo is a set of kind of Kubernetes native tools for uh, running and managing jobs and applications, particularly, uh, you know, uh, basically on Kubernetes. Um, our tagline uh, from the beginning of the project has been basically get stuff done with Kubernetes. We saw at the time that a lot of people were starting to, this was about two years ago, a lot of stuff, people were starting to experiment with Kubernetes, creating Kubernetes clusters. Uh, and of course, you know, some people started running scalable microservices and so on right away, but a lot of other people are trying to figure out like, what do we do with Kubernetes? And uh, we thought that in addition to running obviously long-lived applications, which you know, Kubernetes supported from the beginning, uh, things like uh, batch jobs, workflows, event-based processing, all of those were also very important uh, modes of computing and that any like large application would likely use a combination of these techniques. So we wanted to create a, a you know, tool set which would uh, make it easy for people to create, orchestrate, manage uh, these kind of uh, you know, more complex applications. And so we focused on workflows first and then we did events and then Finally, we did kind of more like this continuous deployment or CD, uh, CD aspect of the project. So the Argo project consists of three main components. Uh, the most mature of those components is Argo Workflows. That's what we started with, uh, which provides very container native uh, workflow engine basically. And then there's also Argo CD, which does uh, support declarative GitOps for continuous delivery. Uh, kind of a sub component of Argo CD is rollouts, which uh, basically provides additional deployment strategies for, you know, Argo, uh, for applications deployed with Argo CD or other deployment tools. And then finally, there's Argo Events, which is an event-based dependency manager, so that you can uh, integrate events to trigger workflows or to, you know, trigger deployments or to generate messages that can be processed by long-running services. Uh, the Argo, we have a Argo community is a, uh, at this point is a, a fairly large community and, is not, and also uh, is still growing rapidly, particularly right now on the Argo CD front. Uh, and there's a lot of, you can see, you know, uh, marquee recognizable brand names here like uh, Adobe, BlackRock, uh, Google, NVIDIA. They were all very early adopters of uh, Argo. Uh, particularly starting with workflows. And then more recently, like SAP, Ticketmaster, Tesla, Volvo, et cetera. And obviously Intuit is also a big, big user of Argo. Uh, these are some of the kind of community use cases and uh, you know, what some of our users uh, about Argo are saying. And you know, uh, uh, a lot of people obviously do things like batch processing or deployment. A lot of people start with one tool and then as they uh, develop their applications, they integrate other tools from the Argo uh, family. So there's quite a few people using, uh, you know, multiple Argo uh, tools uh, for their application today. And just some uh, example of some of the tweets and so on uh, that's happening in the community. Uh, at this point, uh, the Argo project has about you know 5,000 stars, you know 900 forks, a uh, total of 240 different individual contributors, et cetera, et cetera. I guess the thing that I'm most uh, proud of is that as the projects mature, uh, community contributions have been increasing more and more. So at this point, uh, actually for something like Argo workflows, which has been you know a, a little bit more mature. Uh, actually, 60% of the contributions are coming from the community. So if you look at the pull requests, about 60% are from the community. Uh, and these contributions are not just buckets and so on. There's actually uh, major features complete with GUI, COI integration, and so forth. Kind of a brief history of uh, the Argo project. The, the project was launched about two years ago in August of 2017. Uh, shortly thereafter, Platix uh, was acquired by Intuit. Uh, at Intuit, we started the Argo CD project initially to meet the needs of Intuit internally. And then in May of 2018, 
actually early we had always wanted to integrate kind of event-based integration uh, uh, with our Argo, and we had kind of started a uh, opened a GitHub issue on Argo to discuss what this type of integration may look like. Uh, when the, uh, BlackRock approached us and said, "Hey, we use Argo, and we also wanted event-based integration, and we've actually been working on one for the past two months." So uh, you know, let's get there and, and discuss it. And uh, we really liked what they'd done. And they also decided that it would be great to contribute Argo events to the Argo project. And so in May of 2018, that's when Argo events uh, was contributed by BlackRock as a part of the Argo project. And then in June 2018, uh, we got our first uh, big user of workflows for the ML use case when uh, Kubeflow uh, de decided to adopt Argo as the workflow engine, uh, which is basically the workflow engine be behind Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, they did implement their own UI on top, but it's basically you know, Argo uh, underneath. And then in July 2018, uh, we put uh, Argo CD into production, use it into it. And today it's uh, deploying and managing a few thousands of uh, applications and namespaces uh, at Intuit. Uh, in November, uh, we decided to expand on the Argo CD or continuous delivery by introducing additional deployment strategies, which the native Kubernetes deployment is lacking, such as Blue, Green, and Canary. And we, we launched this feature at KubeCon in May. And uh, uh, Argo ROS is actually widely used at Intuit, particularly because we have some legacy applications, particularly the Blue, Green deployment is very popular. Uh, but uh, we're working on a new version called, right now we're calling it Argo Experiments, which allows it to basically concurrently run multiple versions of the application simultaneously and do experimental comparisons between, between them. Uh, and also use that data to automatically you know, determine whether uh, what version goes to production. Right? And of course, in May 2019 also, Intuit was selected uh, as a CNCF uh, top end user uh, I think, you know, uh, and the Argo project, I think, had a big role in that. Uh, without the Argo project, it probably would have taken longer for something like that. Uh, of course, Kubernetes use at Intuit has been growing very rapidly. Uh, right now, Intuit consists of four major business units, uh, you know, along the lines of some of our main products like TurboTax and QuickBooks. As well, as there's kind of a central team as well. And all four of these, uh, major business units have adopted Kubernetes uh, uh, and, uh, you know, are basically, uh, you know, are starting, are using Argo as well. Uh, so, so the adoption of Kubernetes and Argo at Intuit has been you know, very rapid. Okay, now to get into some of the more details, like, uh, so we're discussing Argo as a collection of three main projects. How are they related? And what makes it a single toolkit? Uh, so I mentioned before, Argo makes it very easy to kind of combine workflows, events, and applications to create more kind of complex applications, basically to orchestrate jobs and services related to these applications. And so if you look at like events, for example, events can be used to trigger workflows. This was the original use case that motivated BlackRock to uh, create Argo events and to contribute it to Argo. Uh, and workflows can obviously also generate events. Events can be converted into messages, which are processed by uh, long running applications. And those applications can also generate events. Similarly, workflows can trigger deployments and also trigger workflows. We, uh, we think that in a, a large complex applications, you'll really be using multiple modes of computing. You're not just gonna have long running services. It's not just going to be event based. Uh, you know, you're gonna have some ba uh, background async or batch processing components as well. So, uh, the goal of the Argo project is to really create a single uh, toolkit, which makes it easy to manage these kind of uh, complex applications running on Kubernetes. Uh, a little bit more detail in terms of Argo workflows. What is Argo workflows? Uh, Argo workflows, all of, all of the Argo components are implemented as declarative you know, Kubernetes resources. Uh, that's what makes them like Kubernetes native. Uh, it allows us to build uh, layers of abstraction in a very declarative way, right? starting with you know, containers and pods, deployment services, applications, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, and uh, with algo workflows, each step in the workflow is basically a pod. So uh, it maps very well to kind of the, the Kubernetes uh, native abstractions. Um, it, it does it does mean that the workflow step is uh, is kind of a granular, right? The uh, container does take a little bit of resources and time to start up. So it's not designed for like fast type of workloads, right? Uh, it also allows you to specify workflows in two different ways. You can specify it in more like a step-based sequential and in a fork join parallelism type of fashion, or you could use specify arbitrary DAGs. And the DAG form is particularly popular with uh, folks uh, using Argo workflows for uh, machine learning, for example. Argo CD is a decoder continuous delivery uh, for Kubernetes. And in terms of the kind of definition of terms that uh, SIG app developer is currently working on, you see a picture of that on the right side. Like you have an application which is declaratively specified, it's most likely residing in a Git repo. And there are rollout strategies which basically take those specs and realize them into running workload instances, which consists of like services deployments, you know, rollouts, pods, et cetera. Uh, on our target platform, which in our case is Kubernetes. Right. And it'd be able to do this in a very declarative Kubernetes native way. Uh, Argo events, uh, this is the original use case that, you know, obviously BlackRock created, uh, allows you to uh, respond to uh, various external as well as time calendar or time-based events, uh, as well as internal events. So like one workflow when it completes may create an artifact and the creation of that artifact may trigger another workflow which completes another stage. As workflows become more complicated, it becomes unwieldy to create just one huge monolithic workflow and therefore Argo events allows you to decompose those workflows into smaller, uh, smaller workflows which you can stitch together using events to create a completely automated system for processing um, you know, data or in, in BlockRock's case in uh, doing financial um, risk modeling and other types of analysis. Uh, Kubeflow is another good use case for uh, uh, the Argo project. Uh, they use both uh, Argo workflows as well as Argo CD as a part of their pipelines for GitOps and machine learning. Uh, they, as I mentioned, they built their own UI uh, so this doesn't look like the Argo UI, but basically the underlying uh, components is Argo uh, for, for, yeah. Uh, also like Selden uses Argo workflows uh, and also Argo CD to build and deploy machine learning models uh, as part of their, uh, uh, their product. Uh, so another machine learning use case. Uh, when we started the project, um, we saw that, uh, you know, there, there were obviously other existing workflow engines, uh, especially in the CI space. Uh, but since the CI space was already well established, uh, we decided to build a more general purpose workflow engine and target it for, at other emerging applications at the time, uh, which include obviously Kubernetes, but also a lot of folks doing ML, uh, ML and AI. We saw that there wasn't a great workflow engine for ML and AI, so we did make a conscious effort to try to target those particular areas. Uh, some people were using, you know, uh, trying to use Apache Airflow, for example, which a lot of people uh, use for data processing purposes, but the ML folks were really not using it. And uh, what we found is that, uh, you know, most, most people actually prefer doing something more Kubernetes native, a little more configurable, uh, using something like Argo workflows and Airflows in the ML space. So, so at this point, we have uh, you know major platforms like Kubeflow, NVIDIA's Maglev project, as well as obviously Selden IO. And now internally to Intuit, uh, we've decided to standardize on Argo, uh, you know, as the toolkit for doing ML and AI. <laughs> Some alternatives to Argo. These are the projects that. Uh, we get uh, most often compared with, and so I wanted to describe this to provide some context in terms of how the Argo project may fit into the CNCF uh, you know, uh, landscape. So in terms of workflows, we most often get compared with something like Apache Airflow, 
which is obviously from Airbnb, and is a uh, is a you know they have a wide range of plugins for uh, like big data processing type of applications. Uh, so it's very popular in that space, but it's not Kubernetes native. And uh, what I've heard recently is that a lot of people are doing ML today on Kubernetes, and uh, you know of those, uh, you know. A lot of them are actually using like seventy five percent are using Kubernetes for ML if they're using containers. So uh, we found ML to be a large growth uh, or driver for Argo workflows. Another uh, project, obviously, that we often get compared to is Flux, uh, which is from WeaveWorks. Uh, they they started the kind of the uh, coined the GitOps term. Uh, the approach to the way we do CD is, of course, a little bit different. We designed Argo CD more from an enterprise perspective, managing uh, many clusters, multi-tenant type of environments. But where Flux really excels is, you know, if you want to uh, deploy something very quickly, you have full access to the cluster, you want to bootstrap the cluster. So it's a very kind of different uh, use cases were driving the core design of it, although you could use either uh, either project, obviously, for uh, you know, applications as well as, you know, cluster bootstrapping or other applications. Uh, another project that we sometimes get compared with, particularly the Argo events side, is Knative from Google. Uh, obviously, Knative is more of a fast system rather than a workflow system. We're focusing more on coarse-grained workflows uh, and of having good integration obviously between events, workflows, and uh, long-running deployments. So those are some comparisons. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, any questions? Yeah, I had a few. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Very, very uh, impressive technology and, and very lucid presentation. Thanks for that. Uh, I had you. a few questions. One is, um, these workflows that are running inside um, this, this technology, how how aware of they are they that they're part of it and how do they interact with with the Argo framework? That's the one question. And the other one is is uh, the data that flows between these various workflow elements. Um, what is the typical, you know, how much of that is provided by Argo and how, how much do you just leave on external, you know, storage or queuing systems or whatever? Oh, uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so, um, so one of the great things about Argo workflows and the whole suite of Argo tools is it's kind of native integration with Kubernetes. What this means is that you can use all of the Kubernetes features, uh, including like volume mounts, or you know, uh, being able to create other resources, Kubernetes resources and workflows, all natively from inside uh, Kubernetes work, uh, uh, Argo workflows. So basically, you could include a Kubernetes spec in many cases, you know, you know, almost as is as a subcomponent, and you could you know create that resource while running the workflow or you could create a, a, a persistent volume and mount it and so on. Argo also provides a, a nat Argo native feature called artifacts, which automatically packages like the output of one step in a workflow, uh, puts it in, you know, say something like S3 or something, and then automatically imports it as a input to another step in the workflow. Or uh, ML type of applications where you're doing a lot of data processing, where you have a very large data sets, oftentimes, uh, uh, folks will uh, store the data in something like, e, you know, a cloud file system like EFS or XFS or something like that. And then they strictly just mounted from Argo workflows. Argo workflows can be very uh, sophisticated. Like you could have an Argo workflow that actually spins up complete services. So uh, we have some workflows, for example, that spins up a MySQL database. And then while it's running experiments, actually updates the database. And then at the end, you could issue queries to generate a summary and the output of running this workflow is the summary. But in the process of running it, you created all these other services which you needed to process the workflow. So does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Jacob mentioned in the chat as well, I, I was wondering about how the, I'm not the whole workflow engine as much as the task definition overlaps or doesn't or competes or doesn't with Tekton. Uh, oh, sorry, I, uh, your last part was garbled a little. Could you repeat that? Oh, uh, so I was wondering how the 
task definition to overlaps or doesn't or competes or doesn't with the Tekton project? Okay. Yes, Argo uh, workflows particularly has uh, commonalities with Tekton. Obviously, a workflow engine is a workflow engine at the end of the day. Uh, where, where I find that a lot of uh, these workflow engines differ is that they kind of get defined by the original set of like users and applications or community that they attract because future uh, like features and so on get driven by it. So when we started Argo Workflows, for example, there were other workflow engines that existed. Uh, most of them were not Kubernetes native because Kubernetes was just starting at that point. Uh, also, a lot of these workflow engines like you know Jenkins, for example, they were targeted at a, already a specific use case like CI. Uh, and so that's why we didn't want to compete in the CI space. Uh, we, so when Argo started, it, ML was starting up. So a lot of people uh, uh, doing ML use it. Similarly, as Tekton starts up uh, you know, and, and grows, I think they have to decide uh, like what is the main community they want to serve. Usually as workflow engines become established, it's difficult to like displace them unless something weird happens from uh, the community that's already accepted it. So I feel like there will always be newer workflow engines and they'll just be like targeted toward newer application areas that emerge. I guess the distinction there, like my understanding from the Tekton project is they're actually actively trying to not do that. Okay. Um, uh, they're, they're basically trying to say we're a low level substrate that people can build these things on top of. Um, and, so, and with an aim towards sort of interoperability of some of these definitions. And I was wondering if there'd been any conversations yet between the Argo and Tekton folks, but it doesn't sound like it. Right. Yeah, I think that's a, you know, uh, that's another it, approach that you can take is to build a, a common denominator. And then perhaps other projects may use it, you know, like, for example, like Qflow uses, uses Argo, for example. So yeah. these tools get incorporated yeah. into larger uh, frameworks serving more specific user community. So, yeah. I if I could add, uh, hi, this is uh, If I could add just one thing, like one of our users has actually implemented um, Argo CD to Tekton integration, where, as you point out, Tekton is trying to provide the substrate for doing CI CD and to integrate Argo CD into the Tekton kind of framework, if you will. So they're not mutually exclusive, but there is right. an overlap. Now we can see there is another question raised in the chat. Um, it's, it's actually asking that workflow seems very generic and should it be more of a delivery workflow engine? So I think the question is like, uh, what is the relationship with Argo uh, workflow part of the application delivery? Because I, uh, I think the question is talking about that the, the workflow is actually have a larger scope than application delivery. Uh, Yes, I mean you could use workflows for a lot of a lot of different things. Uh, there's definitely, an uh, I think, an interaction between workflows, as well as you know the application delivery. For example, and it also depends on how what, how you view the term application. Like if you view it in a narrower scope, like it's a set of like deploy bins, pods, and so on for running long running services, then workflows is not strictly a part of that. But if you, de uh, if you to view application delivery or application as building a set of services that accomplishes a particular function, then most complex applications probably would use combinations of, uh, you know, like async backend processing, which workflows are very well suited for, as well as long running services, as well as various forms of event management. So in that broader context, I think all of these are really part of application delivery. Yeah, my question was also how you would relate uh, to what you're doing with uh, also relating to kind of uh, CNCF project with Brigade. I obviously see the difference in, in, in the approach there. Uh, but it would be good to hear like your opinion on, also not just that the, the Maybe the difference between those, I think we all want to encourage the project collaborate uh, together, maybe splitting it the other way around. 
uh, how would you see uh, being part of CNCF profit or what would be your interaction points with the other work for projects uh, as well? Uh, other work for projects? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I think that we should all kind of work on maybe creating a more abstract spec in terms of, I think uh, the, the approach that SIG application delivery is already taking in terms of defining, uh, you know, Kubernetes obviously didn't have a native concept of application when they started. And what people want to do are run applications, not in individual pods, you know, that, you know, that kind of thing at the end of the day. Uh, and so you're defining like, what are the basic abstractions and terms? What does it mean? What are the boundaries between these components? I think something similar could be done for, for workflows as well. Uh, so we're actually interested in, we're, we're creating a draft right now of some basic terms uh, and application areas in this uh, kind of modeling it based on like the definitions that uh, application SIG, uh, SIG delivery has already created for uh, you know, applications. And maybe, you know, uh, we might also discuss in the future whether uh, we should take a broader view on applications. Is it just like running pods and so on? Or is it something a little bit broader? You know? So Ed, it's good, it, it's good that you brought that up. It's, it's almost like um, we need the SIG to actually help us define what applications look like. So exactly. SIG app delivery is, is we're definitely on time now. Right. It's, yeah. a, it's a great topic. I, I think I've really struggled to try and define an application. Think about what it might even be. It's such yeah. a slippery concept in Kubernetes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And we'd really like to, you know, actively participate in the discussion, by the way, I'm sure lots of other folks uh, would as well, but right now uh, we're seeing, you know, like massive adoption of Kubernetes at Intuit uh, for the past year and a half, actually we've, to be frank, we've had our head down just supporting, into its needs. Uh, but as the use case grows, our group has been growing and we now have uh, much more bandwidth to interact with the community as, as community as well. So we're also really happy to see you know, SIG app delivery being formed because I think there's a really uh, big need here to define these standards and kind of work together to at least create a framework that everyone can relate to even if there are separate projects and uh, you know, products. Yeah, if I could add just one thing, I think from the vantage point of, uh, especially sitting in a large enterprise like Intuit, um, run, um, this company has been around for like longer than 35 years and has accumulated uh, varied forms of applications and uh, and different technologies. So the, um, uh, the way the application is defined is definitely much broader than just the deployment or just a service in Kubernetes. So the technologies that we actually use all three to drive the transformation of uh, Intuit into leveraging Kubernetes natively and uh, cloud technologies in, in particular, like all the CNCF projects to deliver value for running these like myriad applications that we have uh, within Intuit. Yeah, and particularly as an end user, uh, we'd also like to help uh, bring in the other end user communities into you know, and get their feedback and interest and, uh, you know, uh, work with them as well to kind of decide when, what are the actual needs of the end users who are using Kubernetes in terms of application delivery? Uh, is it only like, you know, long running services and pods or are they also looking at, you know, eventing and, you know, workflows and so on? And do they want some way to integrate, integrate all of this so that they, you know, they could deploy a complete complex application. Yeah, I think there's a fix. So the, uh, there's a space for this. And yeah, I think the event-based application piece is something I find interesting. And also the machine learning uh, part is obviously what I found the most intriguing one, honestly. Not that the other parts are not interesting, but this is something that we currently don't cover at all. Uh, how like a machine learning application would be, how pipeline for this would be look like, how delivery for these types of application looks like. I think this adds also a uh, very interesting aspect to the entire discussion here. Was there, there was a question about... Uh, oh, go ahead, Asish. Okay, there was a question about the uh, underlying backbone that Argo uh, is using for uh, these messaging uh, pipeline 
I think it probably got lost because there were multiple questions uh, uh, were asked. So can you help us understand where, where, whether Argo is using more of a native Kubernetes uh, storage and communication mechanism or any other external element into that? Yes, actually you can use both. Um, uh, we discussed a little bit about storage uh, that you could use persistent volume claims or you know, even an NFS file system, EFS, XFS, uh, all of that, uh, you know, Kubernetes already supports. And since, uh, you know, Argo is built on top of Kubernetes, you can basically use all of those. And that's one of the advantages, I think, of uh, basing it on Kubernetes and making it native rather than creating a wrapper around Kubernetes and then having to re-implement all of these features that you want to integrate. But more specifically to your questions about messaging, uh, we're kind of agnostic about what the underlying message, you know, backbone should be. Um, that could be just Kubernetes events at a very similar level, or it could be like a NAT service you spin up for messaging. What Argo events does is it defines uh, things like gateways and sensors, which allow you to create, for example, a gateway for input events into the system. And then, uh, and then also define more complex rules in terms of what sets of events can trigger you know, messages or, or workflows or other types of activity in the system. So that's the basic infrastructure that events provides. But in terms of the actual messaging back, backbone, you could use NATS, Kafka, uh, just Kubernetes events. Uh, you know, so we're agnostic to that. Thank you. Thank you. So Ed or Sarai, um, I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about um, the relationship of Argo CD to Helm uh, and uh, sort of like the different uh, representations of quote an application uh, with regards to a Helm application versus um, what sort of Argo CD views as an application. Right. So yeah, I'll let Saradi answer that. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, um, we have taken the conscious uh, decision or choice or made the choice to not uh, be, uh, uh, like, be agnostic to the configuration management tool that uh, you define the application in. So in that sense, the customized um, support or case on support or Helm support is, th those are things that you just uh, uh, use for defining your application, whichever system actually fits your needs. What we also are doing in Argo CD in the next version which on the roadmap is to have first class support for Helm. What that literally means is to be able to have a Helm uh, repository that you point Argo CD to, much as you would point Argo CD2 to a, a Git um, repository uh, that you have your definitions written in. And we will actually understand the Helm chart uh, from the repository and apply um, uh, the same mechanisms that we would apply if as if it were defined in let's say customized. So in that sense, we are baking more of a Helm uh, repository uh, first class citizen support like you would have from a uh, Git repository support perspective. Right, in, in general, like Helm has obviously multiple you know, components or facets. One is as a, it, it's a way of packaging applications. There is a, a bit of a deployment component as well. Uh, but the Argo tools are kind of agnostic in terms of what configuration management tools you use for the application and how you package the application. We want to support all of the popular ways of packaging the application, whether it's a Helm chart or some, some you know, case on thing or some, some other type of thing. So, uh, and then configuration management obviously is another entire broad area, very uh, complicated uh, set of problems there. So we're kind of, at the moment, we're agnostic to those, uh, those aspects. Yeah. And in fact, Jesse, who is the principal engineer on this project, has actually written a fantastic blog post on various configuration management tools um, and, and why we had made the conscious choice to be agnostic to the configuration management tools. Hi, guys. Uh, actually, I think we can uh, stop the first topic here because we still have two projects need to be need to present. So let's go to the next project. I'm really sorry that we just discussed for so long here and I will try to follow up with you guys offline. Okay, so I think the next project is Operator Framework. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, so this is the um, uh, CNCF incubation proposal for the Operator Framework. My name is Daniel Messer. I work at Red Hat in the Operator Framework 
community space. And um, what we are looking at here is something that emerged from us noticing about two years ago already um, that uh, we are now approaching the third wave of Kubernetes applications, um, applications on top of Kubernetes, which we call advanced distributed systems. So we started with systems that were fairly stateless and fairly easy to deploy with the onboard functionality in Kubernetes. And we moved over to more stateful applications uh, with things like stateful set, um, eventually arriving at the need to run applications like actual distributed databases, distributed tra um, tracing frameworks, message queues on Kubernetes for an extended period of time. And the key aspect here is that these systems actually require active care beyond the onboard functionalities of the built-in Kubernetes controllers. Um, and the key theme here is day two automations and lifecycle management. Um, what the operator framework is about is giving um, developers uh, the tools to build, test, and publish Kubernetes operators uh, in, a, in an iterative development cycle and also help owners of clusters, providers of clusters, provide a simple place to manage available operators on cluster in a, in a single location. So on a high level overview, the operator framework is um, divided to three parts. Um, first and foremost, it's an um, upstream open source project aiming at the entire Kubernetes community. Um, it's obviously compatible with, with Kubernetes um, and developed on, on this platform. Um, the operator SDK is targeting the developers of operators. Um, this is the build stage uh, where the SDK helps you uh, skip over a lot of the um, regular border plate code that you need to have in place in order to write an operator and order to interact with the API server to register uh, yourself for watches uh, and reconciliation cycles and just focus on uh, the uh, application code, uh, the code that is specific to managing your application which is the uh, unique property of the operator, obviously. Um, the lifecycle manager is targeting Kubernetes admins. Uh, so these are the people who are responsible for the stability of the cluster um, and offering additional services on top of it to uh, the users of those clusters. This is the component that uh, deploys and runs operators. And then there is another uh, upstream effort in order to provide developers and people interested in searching for operators a place to uh, search and publish uh, uh, their creations. So this is uh, operatorhub.io. Um, the history of operators goes uh, back all the way to 2016, where the concept was initially introduced by CoreOS, um, starting with three uh, operators here on the SED, Prometheus, and Vault side. And this then quickly took off in the community. So we had early adoption on very popular open source projects uh, in the storage space, in the database space. So um, primarily all those workloads that require active care and um, are otherwise fairly difficult to run on Kubernetes um, with external systems of scripting to try to impose uh, state uh, and configuration on those. What the operator does, it does this on cluster uh, and it does it um, very specific to the application. Uh, in 2018, we actually officially launched the uh, operator framework as an upstream open source project um, with the SDK OLM and a metering operator uh, under the Apache 2.0 license. And um, we've seen that this video unlocks the potential for running stateful workloads in a very safe and predictable fashion on Kubernetes. So we had a ton of onboarding uh, from very popular workloads on, on Kubernetes, MongoDB, Redis, MySQL, Postgres, all those leverage the operating pattern in order to define how such a workload gets deployed uh, on cluster and how it is managed especially with a focus on day two operations. So if you want to do things like backup of your database, restore, um, more complex reconfiguration that requires a lot of orchestration, um, the operator uh, uh, emerged as the go-to pattern. Why am I sure? I'm a... Is there a question or is this? Okay, no question. Um, at the same time, we also started uh, to form uh, a, uh, a discussion forum under the OpenShift Commons uh, umbrella. This is an uh, open source community uh, for the origin OpenShift uh, upstream project and we formed this uh, SIG there that has monthly community meetings uh, with good participations. And we also have a mailing list in place uh, that has a lot of com um, community contribution from the larger Kubernetes space. Mm -hmm. um, 
in 2019, I think we reached an inflection point where uh, at, a, at a much broader level throughout the Kubernetes community, there were discussions around how add-ons to Kubernetes uh, control plane are going to be managed. And um, one part of the operating framework, the uh, lifecycle manager, is, is one of the uh, technologies that was uh, that is on the consideration of this particular C plus lifecycle uh, group. We also launched. Um, uh, hey, could you could you mute, please? I think you're you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, uh, Microsoft, Google, Red Hat, and AWS uh, launched Operator Hub.io, which is part of the Operator uh, framework in the sense that it is the place where these operators published there are stored, and um, using the packaging format that is compatible with the with the framework, it's um, targeting Kubernetes users who look for an easy way to discover high quality, well maintained, and uh, frequently updated operators in the central location, uh, and also provide a uh, very straightforward experience of actually deploying them. Uh, on cluster. And um, today we have a widespread adoption of um, the operator pattern as well as the tooling around this. The operator SDK is um, uh, a project that is, is leveraged a lot by ISVs and uh, authors of uh, stateful applications in order to create operators. Um, there's a whole ISV side to this where commercial vendors are using the framework in order to package their operators and deliver operators to their customers in order to provide really good um, service. And um, uh, the session attendance at KubeCon in Seattle, Barcelona, uh, really reflects that, that broad level of interest. Now, a little bit more detail on some of the components. Um, the SDK uh, is a tool that uh, developers use uh, on their uh, workstations to scaffold code and provide a, um, a, a code structure to how to write operators. Um, this is heavily leveraging controller runtime um, in order to let the uh, author focus on um, the reconciliation loop uh, of the operator. Um, this is primarily happening for Go-based operators, um, but the SDK also addresses um, other audiences in the Kubernetes space um, that are more on the ops side of things and might not be as proficient in Go in order to, for instance, declaratively um, uh, define an operator with Ansible playbooks. There's also a no-code approach using Helm charts. So the SDK supports um, an almost uh, no-code or zero intervention conversion from a Helm chart to an operator, which alleviates the need to run Teller on cluster and gives your operator just enough permissions to do what exactly uh, the chart requires, and also gives your chart now a proper interface in the form of a custom resource definition. Um, this is accompanied by a testing framework. Um, we believe that operators are important and impactful workloads on the cluster and need to be tested very, very well because the users trust these uh, services to manage their production applications eventually. So the SDK also comes with a testing framework and verification and scoring tools that help the developer judge the maturity um, of their operator. It also integrates in the rest of the framework in terms of uh, generating uh, the bundle and packaging format which is uh, used by the Lifecycle Manager. The Lifecycle Manager is an on-cluster component. Um, it's implemented with two operators, um, providing a central place to discover, deploy, and use operators at scale on the cluster. And I think at scale is the keyword here in a world where you only have a single operator um, and, uh, uh, and a single version on a single cluster. Um, this all might be fine being manually deployed, but um, as you buy into the whole idea of running um, operator-backed services at scale on clusters, there should be a central place uh, that controls how these things get installed, how these things uh, get deployed, and how users can discover those um, on cluster. And this is exactly what the lifecycle manager does. It defines a packaging format for operators and has the concept of um, catalogs that can be hosted in standard uh, container image registries. And against those, uh, against those you can um, uh, state the intent that you want to install an operator and keep it updated. So uh, the lifecycle manager introduces a concept where the author has direct control over the update graph uh, of the operator. Again, operators being long running, important, impactful workloads on the cluster should be updated fairly frequently. Um, and we provide means to do that with the lifecycle manager. Um, 
operators are also um, always workloads that have a global impact on the cluster due to the global nature of CRDs. So the lifecycle manager also provides a lot of guardrails in order to do that safely on the cluster. There are checks against ownerships um, of existing uh, CRDs against existing operators. Um, there are measures in place that prevent um, uh, privilege escalation um, from the usually highly privileged service accounts that operators are using since these are all on cluster workloads. Um, there's also, as part of the catalog concept, the ability to um, implement segregation of concerns with operators. So if an application stack consists of multiple stateful services, um, there's the concept of dependencies between operators that uh, would allow one operator to specify dependency on uh, another operator. And once you install such an operator, OLM would resolve the dependency at install time and make sure this operator is available and up and running as part of a larger stack. And um, you can use this pre, um, very um, uh, well expressed update model also to control the updates to the managed application. Uh, what's displayed here is one variant of this. It, it's uh, not the only model that we support, um, but as you can see, this is the author of an application as well as the author of being the um, uh, developer for the operator managing this application. You can tie the lifecycle of the operator very closely um, to the lifecycle of the managed application. The third part, Operator Hub.io, is a web page um, on that named address. It's a joint effort between Amazon, Microsoft, Red Hat, and Google. We launched this in February this year. We uh, now have over 75 operators uh, published there and multiple versions getting frequent updates. This is a community curated place um, where people can just publish their operators. Um, it comes with automated testing and PR-based review process, and it's agnostic to the type of operator. Um, and the way they got created. So this is not dependent on an operator being created with the SDK. Um, SDK operate, created operators obviously have the advantage that a lot of the packaging is already uh, created uh, for you. Um, this is also giving you um, straightforward instructions given um, OLM is deployed on the Kubernetes cluster how to install an operator. And this also provides a uh, public catalog uh, for um, operators that people can use uh, in their clusters. A couple of statistics from the community. Um, we have uh, two and a half uh, thousand GitHub stars. Um, we have a lot of clones, especially in the SDK side, a very brief frequent release cycle. Um, over 160 uh, individual contributors uh, with 38 uh, con uh, organizations contributing. Uh, this is also including the uh, community operators um, that we've just seen. And we have also a very active uh, mailing list in the operating framework special interest group with over 480 uh, subscribers. Um, overall, the feedback has been uh, very good. Um, uh, so you see here a couple of mentions of the framework, uh, the SDK and all and uh, on Twitter uh, from Brandon Phillips, for instance, and also some of the uh, companies that provide application packaging. Um, so Benze Cloud is, is uh, one such company that, um, for instance, provides this enterprise supported version of Vault. Um, and um, I think, the, in general, the uh, community has reached a point where um, it becomes clear that if you want to run a type of stateful application um, that has reasonable complexity, um, you should use the operator pattern in order to um, automate this sufficiently with the workload that's actually running on cluster and, and, and not outside trying to impose itself on the cluster. So this is a quote from uh, one of the Google software engineers here uh, from the last uh, KubeCon in, in Barcelona, actually. Um, behind operators, there's a huge momentum uh, in the software vendor space, um, obviously because it's a very nice way to provide um, very good user experience on cluster, um, very well integrated into Kubernetes itself. Um, which is also why we call these Kubernetes native applications. Um, so a couple of popular examples here are um, uh, Dynatrace, Portworx, uh, Sysdig, um, uh, or uh, uh, Redis and Jaeger. All these companies are uh, providing operators um, and uh, as part of a way to ship their software. But we also have a lot of open source contribution from uh, vendors that don't ship uh, Kubernetes. Uh, uh, products um, or software products primarily like uh, Volkswagen or Zalando or Coles. In terms of alignment with the uh, community, I think um, I think app deliveries charter uh, lines up very well with um, 
the capabilities that the framework brings to our table. So um, application definition and guidance and best practice on application design is something the SDK um, uh, makes it very easy to tap into uh, for operator developers. Um, this also gives you the basic composition of an operator structure and metadata right out of the box. Um, there's a bundling concept in OLM that um, takes care of the packaging and dependency management of operators on cluster as well as off cluster. And it's, um, as part of the operator program, very well integrated based on uh, uh, CRDs into Kubernetes itself. So um, every operator ships CRDs. The uh, lifecycle manager is uh, developed with operators as well. The installation is driven uh, by uh, CRDs. And the lifecycle model imposed by the operator lifecycle manager with its defined update graph uh, very nicely taps into the release management charter of this group. Um, we also align with other CNCN projects. So SIG cluster lifecycle I mentioned in the beginning. Um, there's an add-on sub-project that discusses how to manage um, cluster add-ons like Q proxy or DNS um, and how those come to life. And, and OLM is discussed as a potential alternative there. We work very closely with QBuilder these days in order to um, uh, join efforts on the Golang-based operator side. So QBuilder is also a, a project that focuses on helping Go-based de uh, Go developers writing operators. And we look to leverage uh, some of their work as well as uh, contribute uh, and, and jointly into some of the controller runtime uh, space uh, in order to um, um, uh, move this forward. And um, uh, a lot of CNCF projects um, that are already incubated and, and, and graduated use operators as their primary way of um, uh, distributing and, and working on clusters. So rook.io is another example, um, as well as Envoy uh, and Vitesse. Um, that's it from my side. Um, any questions? Daniel, there's a couple in the um, chat from yeah. Jay. Sure. And first question was about stateful versus uh, stateless services. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in, in general, um, the built-in functionality in Gunas um, covers this part um, fairly well. However, there are uh, use cases where an operator also benefits state-less workloads. Um, the primary advantage is easy common to play with stateful workloads uh, because that's where uh, it's usually not as straightforward to model these um, scenarios with um, built-in Kubernetes controllers, right? Especially when it comes to uh, being able to um, execute application-specific uh, logic. Um, there's also a question around the service broker uh, uh, project. Um, so service brokers in, 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 in general is um, something that I personally do not see a lot of momentum anymore uh, over, overall uh, from the bigger players in the background there as well as the overall community. The concept um, of the service uh, broker is largely replaced by the operator pattern, uh, I would say. Um, and there is there are some commonalities between OLM and service brokers, uh, but due to the nature of operators and, and some of the uh, specific aspects of running them on cluster, I, I, I think it, it's only at a very high level. Um, so, um, mostly, mostly I was just referring to, so uh, open service broker has this sort of concept of like a plan. Um, which is kind of like, you know, like a bundle of um, provided services, I guess. Um, and it kind of seemed similar to the bundle slash package thing that uh, the one slide about OLM was talking about. That's, that's the reason I brought it up. Yeah, I think that makes sense. There's also an interesting concept um, in the uh, uh, broker space around binding. So how would you actually consume and uh, a service that you just uh, got from a broker. And we have um, similar discussions in the community around how do you consume and inject um, uh, connectivity information from an operator managed um, uh, service into your application because that's eventually what a developer usually wants to do. So um, we are looking at adopting an application binding that concept in the operator space um, uh, as well. And um, uh, the uh, roadmap um, basically has all and also support that. Sorry, guys, we may want to have, we have to stop the meeting because we just uh, run out of time.
And I think if we, uh, we have more questions about the operating framework or operator SDK, especially there are questions about how to choose operators uh, between different implementations, I think we can actually follow up by in our mailing list of a SIG application delivery, and we are very happy to discuss more about all, all of these projects. Okay? So thank sure. you. We have to be very happy. Cool. Uh, we have to propose. Um, the, we have to post upon the uh, the potential of Kudu to next meeting, and Kudu will be the first project to present uh, in the next in the next meeting. Okay. So thank you guys for today's meeting, and uh, hopefully we can see you again in next next week. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.